Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inmobi's Mobile Monday Q&A series. Uh, we have a very special guest today speaking all about gamified rewards. Uh, Dr. Diego Garel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, so we have a number of great questions uh, that we want to cover today. But before we do, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what your research focuses on and, and what you, you tend to take a look at? Yeah, so my research tends to focus on interface design, how you can create interface design that is uh, motivating, persuasive, interesting for people. Um, the main kind of theme of my most recent research was around uh, rewards and how rewards can affect people's usage of interfaces and decision making. And the main takeaway from that research most recently was that rewards are important early in the interaction. So if you want to have as much value for your rewards, um, put them as early in the interaction as possible. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to go further into that or just an introduction. No, that, that's fantastic. Really great. So I guess maybe a follow up question. So if I'm, you know, if I'm a gaming app, and, and a lot of gaming apps now have, have sort of rewarded ad units in them. Um, how early is too early to, to introduce this kind of rewarded ad unit? Yeah, so one of the things about um, rewarding ads is that you're you're basically trying to balance the kind of penalty of an ad in the sense that people don't want necessarily to see them and it interrupts their flow with the benefits of a reward. And um, so what you want to do is maximize the reward to, to penalty ratio, um, which is a little different to trying to get people to um, kind of log on as early as possible. So if, if your idea is to get people to come back um, and log into the app over and over again, I'd say reward as early as possible. Um, but if your idea is to balance penalty against um, value in the kind of ad sense and um, I wouldn't necessarily do that very early because I think a lot of the issues around um, rewards in this kind of space is that you don't give the user enough time to get used to what the rewards mean and how they are used and um, so then whenever you give them as soon as possible it doesn't mean anything to them yet so I, I'd say if you want people to come back to your app, reward them as early as possible so they kind of get a habit of logging in and it becomes an enjoyable experience. And then once you have them a bit more uh, familiar with the app, then you can kind of bring in the ads, bring in the uh, towards the end of the interaction as opposed to near the start. Got it. That makes sense. Inherently with rewarded ads, there's a trade off. And so essentially, as in if I'm an app publisher, an app developer, it's important for me to make sure that users understand what what they're getting and how what they're getting in exchange for the ad is going to be potentially more valuable to them than, say, the 30 seconds that may they may have to in, endure, for lack of a better term, uh, to watch that ad experience. Exactly. So I want to speak a little bit on the the app experience side. So you mentioned that if if you have an, an app or really any kind of digital property, it's important to get that reward sort of sequence going as, as early as possible. What kind of, you know, when, when you say reward, maybe it sounds like you're using it in a pretty general term. So what kind of reward systems tend to, to really get people hooked? Yeah, so when I say reward, it's, um, it, it's kind of dependent on the system itself. So usually, in my research at least, uh, we use rewards as things that are reinforcing, which basically just means that they increase the behavior. So if you you have a video video game app or a mobile game app, um, you want to use whatever in the game would, would increase the behavior and that would count as the reward. Um, and in previous research, one thing that I found interesting was that um, when you give people, let's say on Mechanical Turk, which is a platform where you, you get participants, um, even though they're there mostly for money, I would think, because that's what you kind of pay them to do with the work. Um, 
they seem to be much more motivated or they're more likely to click on the item that gives them um, kind of placements on a leaderboard or makes them feel good about how good they are against other users or other participants. Um, and we found that if we give them kind of uh, a small amount of money that builds up over time for picking a certain other option, um, it was less motivating. Now, I didn't compare the two directly in one experiment, but from two separate experiments, it seemed that people were much more motivated by these kind of gamified rewards um, than they were about kind of small monetary rewards, even though they do add up to, let's say, $5 or $10 or whatever it may be. That's interesting. I, you know, I would almost think it, it, it would be the opposite, that like I'd rather get, say, a dollar then you know get kind of the recognition that comes with you know being a, a top a thousand player but you're essentially you're saying that the research shows the opposite is true yeah so um at least preliminarily um for small amounts of money like that builds up slowly over time it sent it seems to get people less excited than something like knowing i was better than 80 percent of people who did this task um, and um, I know there's some research on overcrowding effect and things like that, but it, it can mean that if you're given a small amount of money and you um, think your time is worth a lot more money, then if we say that your time is only worth, I don't know, 20 cents per hour, um, then that counts instead of a reward, that would count as a, a penalty in, in a sense. And um, so then it does it works against what you want it to do. Yeah, and I think that goes back a little bit to what you were mentioning before about uh, rewarded ads, right? Is that I think if you're a publisher, you have to in, in think about everything that's happening within the app as reward or penalty. And so it's just making sure that you're you're providing a balance between the two that, you know, there may be some penalty that you have in a sense of time spent watching an ad or being served ads. And so just be, making sure that you have kind of appropriate uh, rewards that you're being offered that help to sort of keep the user engaged. Yeah, and from my research as well, I did focus on a kind of habitual processing that people do whenever they're interacting with these systems. So I'm not sure if you're aware of Kahneman's fast and slow system or different names that they have for that system one, system two, and so on. But there's a general idea that the people will interact with different rewards in two different ways. So the, the first way is kind of very logical, deliberate. You think, oh, I should go to work um, and do my eight hours today because I need to pay rent, I need to do this and I need to do that. And that's kind of very deliberate and planned um, uh, and, and kind of logical in a way. But then there's also this kind of more instinctive system, more emotional system, more habitual system that really just goes off your environment, your immediate surroundings, your immediate reward schedules and contingencies that happen around you. So whenever you're playing a game, because you're relying more on this system, because it's more about fun, it's more about engagement and so on, um, you're really kind of uh, affected by the environment itself. You're really affected by little um, differences in timing and uh, value of these rewards and that's what's really motivating you over kind of the logic of knowing anything or, or wanting to do anything and um, and because that system is very based on behaviorism and conditioning um it's also very sensitive to timing so things like temporal discounting which just means that if you give a reward a long time after um the behavior that precipitated the reward and um, it loses a lot of its value. So if you're thinking about training a dog to sit, if you give them a treat 10 minutes after they sat, they're not going to learn the command sit because you, the discounting of the reward is too big. And um, so with something like rewarded ads, um, the, the penalty of watching an ad or the rewards of gaining um, these kind of systems and um, items in the game need to be timed very specifically and precisely so that the behaviors that you want the participants to do more of um, are rewarded and not penalized. So it's something like um, 
a language learning app where it takes a lot of motivation for you to decide, oh, I want to learn this language. Um, if they log in and are immediately met with an ad, even if it's rewarded, um, the kind of main motivating force or the main engagement for that app is more to do with, oh, I want to learn, I want to become better. So um, you're not really pay paying them with the reward that means something to them. So if you have an ad as soon as they log in, it's more likely to penalize the act of logging in than it is to motivate users to buy your pro program or whatever it may be. Um, so you really have to be careful about that. Whereas if you're playing a game where it's all about fun um, and you want to motivate uh, people to watch your ads, then the idea would be that you um, get people used to the rewards, get them to understand how these rewards affect the systems in the game so that they understand, oh, this is really useful and this will really help um, completing this um, character or this building or whatever it may be in the game. And then after you've created these um, associations, you've kind of added this Pavlovian conditioning sort of sense where people enjoy those rewards um, and understand what they do then you can bring in the, the rewarded ad afterwards so that they don't feel penalized. They feel it like it is a transaction where they understand, oh, I really want this and I just need to pay seconds of my time to get this. So then it almost becomes like if you're playing a game and you have a, a store where you need to pay in-game currency to get what you want. Instead of that, it feels like the in-game store is asking you to pay time to get what you want. And then it feels transactional, it feels like you know what you're getting, whereas if um, you're not doing it that way, then, then people can be kind of pushed away and, and not want to come back. Yeah, that, that timing and that explanation are, are so, so critical to, to making sure that your awarded ad units are working. Definitely. So this is maybe a, a slightly larger question, but um, is this, these kind of rewarded systems just sort of tapping into how human brains work? Or have we just become so used to be seeing these kind of reward systems within apps that we've just sort of learned to kind of accept them? Uh, so a bit of a chicken and, and egg question here. Yeah, it, it's an interesting question, I think, because um, we're not sure. There's not a lot of research on it, so we, we can't say for sure. Is it that? Um, people are inherently drawn to these kind of mechanics that people use in games and that's why people enjoy games or have we over time learned because we found so much enjoyment in these games um, and now associated them with mechanics and, that, uh, and so there's this kind of conditioning in a sense where we've had them together for so long that just like Pavlov's bells I don't know if you know about that um, theory um, but whenever we see these mechanics, we remember the the fun we had. And so there's that kind of um, training aspect to it. Um, I think it's definitely both. I think, f for instance, um, I enjoy a good kind of um, fantasy setting to any sort of game or game like gamification to to some sort of app I want to use. Um, mostly because I've enjoyed that setting in video games in the past. So that setting is giving me sort of rewarded um, aspects. Um, if I had never played those, let's say, RPG games, would I have that same sentiment to those rewards? Probably not. Um, but it's still touching on kind of innate parts of human cognition in the sense that people want to um, have autonomy over their own actions. So they want to be successful in the things that they're trying to do within a system and be able to control that system in ways that they predict and, uh, and are useful. Um, um, but we also have other things like um, uh, goal gradient theory, I think it was, where um, whenever we're getting close to the end of a, of a task or a goal, uh, we become more motivated as we get there. So that's something I would say is more intrinsic than it is taught by people. So because we're just closer to the end, we're, we're more likely to like something like that. Um, so I, as I said, I think it is both. I think some of it has been trained over time and some of it is 
game systems or game mechanics or game designers understanding what people want and kind of optimizing for that. Yeah, I think that that last point is actually really interesting, right? Whenever they show movies on TV, they always, you know, at the beginning to get you hooked, have very few commercial breaks. And then as you get to the end and you really want to see how it finishes, all of a sudden there's a lot more commercial breaks. And I think that kind of speaks to that um, sort of reward and, and penalty system that you're talking about before. Yeah, um, and that's something I noticed when I visited America and I was watching TV, which I didn't notice here, maybe because I don't watch TV here, um, but maybe because it's changed since I was a child. But it's something I noticed where a show would show ads just before it would finish. Then the last minute would play, they would immediately play the start of the next episode for about 20 seconds and then show an ad. Whereas when I used to watch TV, um, they would ad put the ad at the very end of the show, like they'd finish the show and put the ad. So I think at least those uh, people are understanding the kind of benefits of and the little break points where people would see this and be like, OK, I'm now done and go do something else. Whereas now they understand that if you start something, people are more likely to stay with it, which is something that Netflix does as well by auto playing the next video and and, and other companies do too. Yeah, for sure. Um, good to know America. We've really got our, our advertising <laughs> set to go. Um, one thing I think that was really interesting about your research that you found and, and would love to hear more about is, is you found that sometimes that the rewards effectiveness can, can decline over time. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so my most recent research didn't look at that, but I have looked at that in earlier research. And um, so I think what you're talking about is, is habituation, which basically means that rewards lose their value over time because just like you become full after eating food and um, you basically become full of um, reward, basically. And um, so um, there's a lot of research even on animals that says that if you um, oversensitize someone to a certain reward, then it loses their value because it's not novel, it's not unexpected, it's just common. Um, and there is good research showing that these kind of sensory rewards or non-primary rewards that you see in gamification or in video games or um, apps of that nature um, do habituate very quickly. So if you use those kind of rewards over and over again, people become bored of, bored of them very quickly. Um, but you also have very quick dishabituation. So if you become bored of those rewards, um, but you let it go for a while, then it comes back much more quickly than if you become bored of, say, um, food or, or, or water or any of those more kind of primary um, reinforcers. Um, so that's good to know when you're thinking about it because it's much easier it's much more important to include novelty um, and reduce oversaturation in these instances. And um, so novelty being highly important means that if you're giving someone a reward for something, um, you have to vary the type of reward um, and when it's shown to make sure that there's um, as much kind of surprise as possible. Um, but also it means that you don't want someone to play your game or your mobile game for 10 hours straight because they will be so habituated by any rewards you can give them um, that they are satiated in the sense and then don't want to come back ever. They're like, okay, I'm bored of this and uninstall the app. Whereas if you can promote what's called snacking behaviors, which is uh, some research that uh, colleagues have done, um, people are much more likely to stay with the app or with the mobile game for longer. Um, so it's a sort of balance you have to strike. Do I want to give as much engagement and fun or, or stick the user to want to stay in the app for as long as possible or in one session and then possibly lose them in the future? Or do I want them to stay with the app long term? Um, and I think that's what habituation kind of tells us. Yeah, it's it's really a, such a fine line, right? Because I, I don't think any app developer would say I don't want people to spend a lot of time in app. But I think you you know how do you find you just have to find that balance between short term gain and and long term gain. 
Yeah, and I think some apps have learned that because you see things like uh, life bars or gems or any of those things, energy meters, where you can't play Candy Crush or whatever it may be for more than 10 levels before you have to wait until it reloads. Um, so I think people understand that these kind of blocking or waiting mechanics do seem to get people to come back and prevent them from habituating too much to the system. Um, but then um, what if someone wants to play for 10 hours because they're on a plane or something or they're waiting for the next um, flight? And um, so that is the balance that maybe you're you're pissing off your customers or users be, because you 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 say, oh, I know what's best for you. Yeah, and I think a lot of that would just come down to just like how well do you know your users, right? And like how do you know who they are and where they play and why they play? Yeah. In in the sense of a game. So I, I'm curious, you know, in some of this research that you've done, has there been anything that you found that really surprised you that was highly unexpected? Uh yeah, I think I talked about it earlier. One of the surprising things I found was that in one study where I used money as a reinforcer, as a reward, um, there was a big preference for um, one option over another that, that gave the money earlier rather than later, which was what I thought I would find. And then when I gave kind of leaderboard points that put people higher on the leaderboard, there was also a big preference for earlier rewards, but the preference was so much higher which would indicate that the value of the reward itself was higher. And um, so I found that really interesting that the um, leaderboards were more motivating in that little game that they played um, or that task than, than money, which I, I wouldn't have expected. Um, but it does kind of give us interesting things to think about. I'm curious and, you know, one thing I've been seeing a lot of of games and apps do is that you know they'll they'll maybe give like cryptocurrency or in in NFT as a reward. Have mm -hmm. you done any research to see like you know I mean it's money in a sense, but sort of a very untraditional um, kind of rewards. Have you done any research to see like how consumers are are reacting to those kind of rewards so far? Um, no, I haven't looked into that much, but I would assume it's very similar to the kind of different economies that build on these systems anyway. So even the games like Animal Crossing or um, that are meant to be kind of relaxing and these economies build up where certain characters are worth this many tickets and so on. And then people will go online and even spend real money on them or things like World of Warcraft will they spend real money. So these things can, in a sense, be NFTs. Um, but also um, kind of representative of real money. And then people will start doing them for the purpose of money. Um, so then if the money that is given is high enough or, in, or uh, useful enough, then obviously someone who wants to make money will go and do that. Um, but if, uh, if you're giving people m small amounts of money compared to rewards in kind of a, a fun sense or a gaming sense, um, if they're not there to get money, um, unless it's a surprising amount that they're like, oh, I'll be able to buy a pizza today or do something fun with it today, uh, it's not as useful as um, kind of giving them positive feelings because uh, money is kind of a second order of reward where you're excited about what the money can do for you more than you're excited for the money. So if you get 20 cents, you think, oh, what can I buy with 20 cents? Why would I care? Um, whereas if you get a hundred euro, you're thinking, oh, well, that's, um, I don't know, a new, two new video games I can buy. So then that's what gets you excited about it. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? It's, it's not the actual like money itself, whether it's a cryptocurrency or, or euros or, or really any currency. It's like that in and of itself isn't value. It's just like, how can you apply that to something that you may find more valuable? Yeah. So it's curious that you mentioned Animal Crossing because, you know, in the past few years, it seems like there's been kind of this whole rise of different platforms and apps that are really kind of wired into this kind of reward system. So not just, you know, I'm thinking kind of metaverse style games like a, a Roblox, um, 
but also TikTok, which I think does a, a really just like honed in job of kind of keeping you sort of hooked. As these sort of new technologies come in, are you seeing that how consumers react to reward system and how they think about reward system is is changing? Um, I would say so. Um, I can't tell you from research because I haven't done any in the area, um, but from personal experience and understanding um, kind of how these reward strategies function, um, to kind of seeing social media posts about people in the field and so on, it does seem that people are, at least for the kind of mobile games where it's people feel a lot it's kind of pay to win or it's it seems very by the numbers. I know that this is what people or the research maybe in the past has said people will find motivating that this is what I'm going to use. So I know a lot of mobile games will use things like gacha systems or, um, you know, the pull a lever and you win um, a character and you, it might be a five star character or a one star character. Um, I, I think people are turning against that in the sense that they understand they're all kind of pay to win in the sense where you only get it. It's it's to get kind of very specific people that are very into that. Um, and if you just want to play a game for fun, you don't want to go in and be immediately bombarded with 10 different gotcha systems where you're trying to win characters that you don't even understand what they do yet or how they're useful or why a five star character is good. And um, so I think that um, kind of these mobile games have learned, oh, variable rewards are more motivating than fixed rewards. So they throw as many variable rewards as you as possible. When in fact, fixed rewards are actually useful when people are starting to learn uh, a con contingency or starting to learn a system because it teaches them about the system. So you want to give them fixed rewards at the start to make them learn about the system. So then they understand and have expectations so that you can break those expectations with variable rewards. Um, and provide motivation and um, engagement. Um, so that's kind of on that end. But with things like TikTok, I, I, I am very interested in their kind of al algorithm because it does, in a sense, act like a slot machine. And um, like you scroll or roll to the next one and is it a hit or not? Will you laugh or not? Will you get angry or not? Um, and it does seem to be very good at finding very niche things that each individual seems to like because you look at one person's um, feed and it's completely different to the next person's feed um, and you can nearly categorize a person by their whatever videos they're shown um, and it also tells you a lot about a person by whatever videos they're shown so i know there was a podcast i was listening to a tech podcast and the main guy on the podcast said oh i don't like tiktok because the only thing i see is scantily clad women dancing and then everyone was like yeah because you don't scroll past those videos you stay on those videos and they learn that's what you want and then he became very embarrassed about it and he was like well i am a man <laughs> what am i gonna do and um, so it is really interesting in that sense where um, they seem to know you so well. And I think part of that is that they can learn a lot because everything is so short, um, kind of scrolling to the next one or staying in the same one. It's all very habitual system. It's all very emotional. It's all very um, reinforcement learning in a sense. So I think those systems can learn very easily what you like because at least from the research I've done, that kind of system is very conditioning based. It's very reinforcement learning based. It's it's very um, reward penalty uh, sensitive. Um, so I think that's something that TikTok has kind of honed in on is understanding that um, because of temporal discounting, because of all these things, a uh, short, um, quick, um, high kind of enjoyment, um, high variability kind of content that that is, um, is really engaging to people. Yeah, and and I think some of it is a matter of you know these these kind of systems have, have you know been in place in in video games or in apps for a while, and really it's just like these these new generation of platforms are kind of taking those those tried and true mechanisms and just you know dramatically improving on it. Yeah, definitely. And they understand kind of the problems of previous systems. So things like um, Twitter or Facebook, you won't get the feed that you want until you start following the right people, at least 
in the past. I'm not on Facebook anymore to know. Um, but uh, th they need your input and they need you to find the people first, tell them what you like, and then they will give you the content, um, which is a lot of effort up front for the user. Whereas with TikTok, I know when I first joined that, it just gave me kind of regional content um, that I tended to enjoy because I don't see a lot of regional content in general. Um, but then just from those, it started started kind of finding out what I liked and didn't like. And now I don't see as much kind of Dublin slash Ireland related content as I did at the very start. It's all very targeted to what I want. But it did mean that I had to put no upfront effort other than kind of scrolling through the videos slightly faster, slightly lower at certain videos. And they just took it from there. Yeah, and I think it's what's really ingenious about their model is that it, it's it's such a low effort on the part of the user to yeah. to build in that reward system, which I think is is one of the many reasons why it's it's become so popular. Exactly, and the effort on the user is like any small barrier, any small effort is what makes you not want to do it anymore, you want to leave because it's going off that habitual system that is so sensitive to these things and these companies know it as well in the sense that if they don't want you to delete your facebook account the hardest thing to find on the profile is the delete button and um, so by the third screen where you can find it you're like oh whatever i don't care anymore so they understand that in the sense and they're using it in that way um, and now kind of TikTok is finally using it in the other way where they're reducing as much barrier to entry um, and understanding how that really affects use. Yeah, and and so one thing I'm I'm curious about, so you know, your a lot of your research being done, you know, within the academy, you know, for for app publishers, app developers that are listening in, you know, how should they be thinking about these reward systems, and and ultimately, how would you like your your research to be applied in the the mobile ecosystem? Yeah, so my research, in a sense, was um, inspired by systems like mobile um, apps, free to play apps, and um, social media websites. All these things where I was learning about the theory already and watching all these um, sites and platforms, I could see what they were trying to do and what they were successful and unsuccessful in. And, um, and I can see they were basing it on some of the ideas anyway, even if they don't make that research or that um, internal research public. Um, so the main idea when I was doing this research is clearly Facebook, Google, all the big companies, mobile app developers seem to have their own research that they do based on their thousands of users and they A-B test everything to the smallest detail and they can tell you that this is the best way to engage users because they found that it increases their engagement numbers or KPIs or whatever it may be. Um, and I thought that was um, less useful for everyday people because they didn't get to see all that research. So I wanted to basically bring to light what app developers and social media developers already knew because they had their own internal data um, and kind of let the cat out of the bag for everyone else. Because then in a sense you can see, oh, how is this company trying to keep your time and attention the most and what can I do against it or how can I understand it? And um, so if mobile app developers are using this to understand how to best motivate users to use their application in a way that aligns with the user's goals, then I would say that is ethical use of the research. But if they're using it um, in the way that these companies were doing already, where you're trying maybe dark design patterns, where you're trying to hide the delete account button as much as possible, um, then I would be less happy about that, but in a sense, that's already happened, and I think not because of my research. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not sad or crying over any spilt milk on that sense. Yeah, and I think that the user education point is is such a key one too, right? Like if if you're playing games, I think it's you know it, I think it, it's helpful to know just you know that of what to what to expect or maybe like why you're seeing some things and, and not others. Yeah, transparency is big because if people 
are feel like they're being used or lied to, then that's a penalty in the sense that it pushes them away. And even though the habitual system is not very visible to your kind of internal um, introspection, um, if it is made visible by someone telling you, oh, they tricked you in this way, then it becomes very negative. So I think the trick is to be transparent from the offset so that people understand what you're trying to do. And if they agree with it, then they won't mind as much that you're doing it um, and they may even be happy about it. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And, and certainly I have a newfound appreciation for everything happening with all of the, the apps <laughs> that I use. So Diego, yeah, this has been a, a great conversation. Thank you for, for jumping on. Any final thoughts you'd like to, to leave folks with today? Um, not really, no, sorry. <laughs> no, no, perfect. Yeah, and uh, really valuable information. Really thank you for your time. Uh, so thank you for, for being a guest today. And, and everyone, thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you.